Thanks, Gersh. All right, this morning, <clears throat> I wanted to preach on uh, the parable of the sower. And uh, the sermon today, I just wanted to remind you all in church that our main purpose as Christians is to be fruitful, be fruitful for the Lord. Um, in John 15, we read here this morning that Jesus said, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So we want our life to bring glory to God. And how do we bring glory to God? Well, we need to be fruitful. And, uh, you know, John 15 is an often misunderstood passage. I just want to point out something quick because, because a lot of people, and we're talking about parables this morning, and sometimes if people use parables the wrong way, they can end up teaching false doctrine. And John 15 is often one that is used to teach that if you don't bear fruit in your life, that, that you will, you know, you're not saved, and that they think that this is what this passage is teaching. Um, but I want to show you here that that's not what this is teaching. It is, it is an encouragement in John 15 to be fruitful. But you can see here, <coughs> Jesus says here in verse 2, every branch in me, so notice there those words, in me, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So this is a branch that is, a, is, a, is, a, is in Jesus, but it's not bearing fruit. So you can see there that there's a distinction between abiding in Jesus and bearing fruit. Right? But you need to abide in Jesus to bear fruit, right? So you can't bear fruit if you're, if you're not abiding in Jesus. But at the same time, time, you can abide, you can be in him, but not be bearing fruit. And you can notice here that it says here that the branch is just taken away. So people assume that that taken away means that you lose your salvation, but that's, that's not the case, right? But later on, you see here in verse 6, it says, if a man abide not in me, Right? So this is somebody that's not abiding in Jesus. Right? It's not, it's not whether or not they're bearing fruit or not. They're not even abiding in the vine. He is cast forth as a branch <coughs> and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So there is an allusion here to salvation in the sense that whether you're abiding in Jesus or not, that's salvation. But whether you're fruitful or not is, is, not, is the question about whether or not you get purged. Right? Whether, whether or not um, you know, he's cleaning you that you'll bear much fruit, right? So that's what he wants people to do. See, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So he wants the branches to bear fruit, but he doesn't want unfruitful branches. So taking away just means, it, it can mean other things, right? Sometimes when people aren't fruitful, they get out of church. They may, they may not be as useful to God as he wants them to be, right? And they're taking up room. Right? We'll see later that being, fr being fruitless is, is, doesn't mean that you have no impact on the surroundings around you. So he's taking it away because it's impacting the rest of the tree. Right? But that doesn't mean you lose your salvation. And the ones that are bearing fruit, you know, and this is a great lesson here from John 15, is that you know, our, we don't clean up our life in order to bear fruit. We try and bear fruit, and then through the bearing of fruit, God helps us to clean up our life. So, you know, not having your life cleaned up is not an excuse not to serve God, not to do things for God, right? Because as you bear fruit, then God purges it, right? Meaning clean it up, that it will bring forth more fruit. Whereas I think a lot of Christians have it the other way around. They think, i got to get, get cleaned up first before I start trying to bear fruit for God. Whereas the Bible's saying, no, no, you bear fruit. And then that's how God, you know, uses that work and that bearing of fruit to purge you and to, that you'll bring forth more fruit. So, one thing we want to be reminded of this morning is that our, one of our purposes in the Christian life is to, is to bear fruit. And really, that's just, a, <clears throat> that's just another way of saying doing things for God, serving God. Because what, what does it mean to bear fruit in the Christian life? It means preaching the Word, you know, the fruit of our lips. It's getting other people saved. You know, as fruit, fruit multiplies. You know, we think about the word is even used with, with bringing forth children. What are you doing? You're, you're multiplying. You're bringing forth more children. So how do you do that in a spiritual sense? It's when you get other people saved, you bring other people to Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing to be fruitful. We're teaching others to get other people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be fruitful. When we, when we, when we boil down, you know, the, the Christian life, you know, we're trying to love God, we're trying to love other people, we're trying to preach them the gospel, get them saved, get them preaching the gospel. And that's the purpose of our life. 
right? Herein is my Father glorified. You know, one of the purposes of our life is to glorify God. How do we glorify God? That you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. <coughs> so the analogy of fruit fits very well in the Christian life because fruit, you know, fruit is like a, it's like a blessing. You know, fruit is like, you know, it's, it's, it's nourishing, you know, it's good for you, uh, things like that. It provides nourishment. Fruit does. And if you think about fruit, like it enables reproduction, you know, with, uh, with a plant. You know, that's where the seeds are and the fruit normally provides nourishment to the next seed and brings forth. So fruit is a, a great analogy that God uses in order to talk about reproduction. So God wants fruitful Christians. So ask yourself this question this morning. Are you a fruitful Christian? You know, when you reflect on your own spiritual life, you know, sometimes throughout the week as we work and we go about our lives and we're busy. But sometimes on Sundays it's good to stop and to think and say, am I, am I truly fruitful for God? You know, when was the last time I, I talked about God's work? You know, did, 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 we, did, we, did we think about the scriptures at all during the week? You know, when, when was the last time I, I talked about the scriptures to somebody else? You know, because you can't be fruitful getting people saved. You never even have the Bible on your mind. And if you never even have the Bible on your mind, you're probably never going to hear the Bible come out of your lips. And if the Bible never comes out of your lips, how do you ever hope to get somebody else saved? You know, so how fruitful are we as Christians? This is what I want to think about this morning. Like, what we need to be fruitful Christians, and we want to be fruitful Christians, we need to be getting other people saved. If we want to be getting other people saved, we need to be preaching the word. And we need, in order to be preaching the word, we need to have the word, you know, in our hearts, in our minds, thinking about these things. So it's, it's an onflow thing. Matthew 21. God wants fruitful Christians. And he uses, you know, the, the analogy of fruit in terms of uh, what he's looking for. Look at Matthew 21. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered. When he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. So we say like, oh, it's a, it's a beautiful tree. It's, it's, it's blooming well. It's got lots of leaves. You know, it's not just, you know, branches. But he found nothing thereon but leaves only. So isn't it interesting that he talks about the tree and says he found nothing on there. But there's leaves on there. Like the tree looks nice. But when it says he found nothing on there, what is he looking for? He's looking for fruit. And he said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee hence forward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. So this cursed fig tree in this parable represented the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was not you know, bearing fruit because they were unbelieving in, their, in the physical sense. We cursed the fig tree. Luke 13. This is a parable. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. And, and this is the part of the passage I want you to focus on here in Luke 13. Why cumbereth it the ground? So some people think, you know, in the Christian life, when they're not being fruitful, they, they, they're not damaging at all the kingdom of God. And this is what I want you to understand this morning, is that when we are not fruitful, when we're not trying, when we're not walking in the Spirit, the only other option is in the flesh. You know, we're not gathering with Jesus. You know, Jesus said, He that gathereth not with me scattereth. So there, there isn't this neutral ground where it's like, well, if I don't do anything, I'm not, I'm not adding to, but I'm not taking away either. False. Right? If you're not adding to, you are contributing to taking away. Like Jesus said, if you gather not with me, you scatter. And if you're not bearing fruit, the Bible says here that it's cumbering the ground. Why? Because it still requires nutrients for a plant to grow its branches, to grow its leaves. It's still taking sun that other things could take. This is why. And this is why unfruitful Christians do the same in church, in, in, in life as well. Right? So we don't want to be unfruitful Christians. We want to be Christians that are contributing as opposed to just sapping away the spiritual nutrients like we see here in Luke 13. And he answering and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. So this is why, you know, it's interesting. 
this is why, like, you know, suffering and hard times in our life is a good thing, right? Because it gets us, try, it's God sometimes trying to get us growing again, right? It, it's, it's interesting that, you know, something so, you know, I mean, if you don't have a green thumb, and I, I don't, you, know, you don't really want to, you know, touch like manure and, you know, <laughs> things like that, or different fertilizers. <coughs> but this is what is helping this thing. Give, give this tree a chance to bear fruit as it requires some dung in its life, right? And that's why sometimes we require some spiritual dung in our life to get us going, right? And bearing some fruit. That's why you don't know, think, you know, like, why is my life sometimes a little bit uncomfortable? Or it's maybe because God is trying to make you rethink things, maybe trying to get you focused on being fruitful again, um, and, and you're not realizing that. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Mark 4. So we look at the parable of the sower, and the reason why I want to look at the parable of the sower this morning is because it gives, the parable of the sower gives us reasons for why Christians are not fruitful. And I like to visit this parable every now and then because it's a good reminder for our church of the different reasons why we're not fruitful, and it's good for us to reflect on our life and see how these things apply to our own life. <coughs> so Mark 4, this is the parable of so Hark, and behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. So you can see here that there are different scenarios that this parable of the sower is going through. So it's a parable because it's an earthly example. It's trying to give us a spiritual truth. And so this sower is going out and he's throwing seed out into the field. The first situation is it falls, falls by the wayside, so it's falling on the path as opposed to on the ground where it needs to be planted. And in, in another parable, another passage says it gets stepped on and the birds come and eat it, right? So it never actually goes into the ground. The second one, some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up. So it does get received into the ground. It springs up, but because it had no depth of it, like it's on stony ground, when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. So that's the second example, right? Where it springs up immediately on the rock, but then the sun comes out and kills it. Verse 7, the sun fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. So this is the thorny ground where the thorns are taking away all the resources and the nutrients and then the seed itself as it, as it springs up doesn't bring forth fruit. And then the last scenario is it fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30 and some 60 and some and 100, right? So we don't have to guess really, like, and we're going to go through this parable, but, you know, we don't have to guess what this parable represents because, you know, Jesus explains to us what this parable represents. And, and you need to be careful with parables. You know, sometimes, you know, when you listen to somebody teaching the Bible, it may make a lot of sense what they're saying. And they're using a parable to justify the things that they're saying. But see, parables are stories in the Bible. They need to be interpreted in light of clear doctrine and clear statements in the Bible. So you need to be careful when a doctrine is built on a parable alone. But see, we don't really have to guess about the parable of the soul because Jesus actually explains this parable. So if somebody comes up with a different explanation for what these different scenarios mean, then we have obviously Jesus' explanation of this parable. But then it can happen with other parables. But parables can be misused. Right, and this is why we, we read in Proverbs 26 here. Look at these, uh, these verses here. It's Proverbs 26, 7. The legs of the lame are not equal. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. So what it's saying here is like when, a, when a fool uses a parable and a wise man uses a parable, that doesn't mean the parable is the same. Just like the legs of the lame are not equal, parables aren't always used equally. And, and we see that when people use them to teach different things. And sometimes they use it to teach, especially the parable of the soul. The parable of the soul is often used to teach a work salvation, right? To say that if you don't bring forth fruit, then you're not saved, which is not what the parable of the soul is teaching. And look at verse 9. 
As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. And, and what I think of when I think of this, this analogy here, is, as a thorn goeth up into the hand of the drunkard, I'm thinking of the drunkard, you know, kind of having to lean on something, and he leans on a thorn bush, and the thorn goes through his hand. And, and the picture I get, I don't know if this is the same picture you get, is that the, the, the thing that the drunkard is depending on holding him up is actually hurting him. And sometimes when people use parables to teach doctrines that are false, I feel like they do the same thing. Like they teach something they don't realize is actually hurting themselves. And, and that's the same with like when people use the parable of the soul to teach a work salvation. They, it's like the, the fool is using this parable to teach work salvation. So he's sort of like putting his, uh, like, you know, hoping that this thing supports him, but it actually hurts him because if, if work salvation was true, then the person teaching the work salvation is not saved themselves. Right? Because if work salvation is true, you'd have to keep all the works, and the person teaching work salvation doesn't keep all the works, so they're using this parable and it actually hurts themselves. That's, a, that's what I think of when I think of this Proverbs 26 verse 9. So let's look at the different situations in the parable of the soul, because the parable of the soul, like I said, explains the reasons why people are not fruitful. So the first scenario is the seed that fell by the wayside. Mark 4. Mark 4, 15, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, <coughs> but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts, right? So the word, they hear the word, but they don't, it doesn't get received into their heart, but in the sense that it's, it's sown in their heart, but not received in. Luke 8, what does that mean? Well, I think we get more insight in Luke 8. Verse 12, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. Look at this. Lest they should believe and be saved. So the seed being received into the ground and springing up is referring to the fact that somebody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and they get saved. So the, the ones that fall by the wayside, these are the people that don't get saved. Right? Now, when we see in verse 13, they on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these having no root, but look, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. So there's a lot of debate over <coughs> <coughs> these other scenarios in the parable of the Zohar, <coughs> like on the rock, the thorns, obviously the good ground. Nobody's, nobody's disputing that the good ground is saved. The dispute always comes is whether those that fall among, the, the seed that falls among thorny ground or the seed that falls among stony ground, are those saved? Well, I think Luke 8 makes it very clear, right? Because on the one hand, it's saying, hey, it fell by the wayside and it didn't go into the ground lest they should believe and be saved. So we're saying that the, the seed falling by the wayside is showing that, that they didn't believe, didn't get saved. But then when it talks about the rock, it tells us that for a while they believed. So that means it did get received in, right? And in time of temptation, fall away. So they might say, you can lose your salvation, and then we would go to other arguments. But I don't want to spend too much time here. But they believed, right? Which means it was received in, and they did get saved. So we're not talking in this second scenario of the stony ground about whether or not somebody got saved. It's about whether, like how this saved person is now, you know, uh, you know, how we understand it in terms of stony ground. But we'll get onto that one in a moment. So we don't have to guess whether or not the person on uh, the, the seed on the stony ground, excuse me, the seed on the stony ground is saved or not. Because the seed was received into the heart, which is what the ground represents. <coughs> Isaiah 64. Now, the reason why it falls by the wayside, it can't be fruitful, because it's not saved, right? And, and a tree that doesn't exist cannot bring forth fruit. And this is why, you know, unsaved people in the eyes of God, no matter if they think they're doing good, they're still sinning in the eyes of God. 
Isaiah 64, 6, where we are all as an unclean thing and all our, unri- our, all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And you think, like, why is that? Why is it that when an unsaved person, even when they try to do good, it's still sin in the eyes of God? Well, it's because if you're not... Remember, the, 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 the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Like, if we don't do things for God, ultimately, then ultimately it's a selfish or a humanistic reason, right? Like, if you, you may be doing something noble in the eyes of man, like you're doing something for your family, you're doing something for your legacy, you're doing something for this, but it's all selfish or man-centered at the end of the day. See, without faith in God and believing that you're doing it for a higher purpose, for God's glory... It's ultimately sin. And this is why when people are not saved and they don't believe in God, they don't believe in God's word, everything they do is sin. Right? So like it says here in Isaiah 64. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Right? So people are hoping. You know, they're hoping, like if somebody's not saved, they're hoping that they're going to please God. But the Bible tells us well, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Look at Romans 14, 23. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Matthew 7. This is a passage that we go to often. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And this, this is the thing that always gets me with this passage, is that these people, they're not like not doing things in Jesus' name. Isn't that interesting? It's like these people, like they're doing things in Jesus' name, and yet they're still not saved. They're still not doing it in faith, right? They're, they're not saved. That's why even if they do these things in Jesus' name, that doesn't mean that they're things that please God. Have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Look at this. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Right? Why? Because they weren't saved. Depart from me. And look at this last bit. Ye that work iniquity. So it's not even that you were, you were doing things, and it was good, it wasn't that bad. You know, they're doing things in the name of Jesus, works in the name of Jesus, casting out devils in the name of Jesus teaching in the names of Jesus, and yet God says to them, you are working iniquity. That's what the unbeliever does when they don't do things as a saved person. Right? So there's a primary application to this first scenario by the wayside, which is the person's not saved. But I always like to think of the secondary application as well, is you know, the seed is... First, first of all, the Word of God being sown in our hearts and then the believer itself. But I also think of the seed being planted, being like the Christian, whether it's planted in church or not. Right? And it's the same, I think, you know, there's a secondary application that, you know, if you don't get yourself planted, like if you are representing of the seed, and I know this is, you know, not the direct uh, application of the parable, but if we think of Christians as the seed, and if they don't get planted, if they fall by the wayside, they also become unfruitful as well. So you don't get planted in a local church. And this is why I like to think of the church as you know, this ground that Christians get planted into. First Timothy 3, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So I often think of this secondary application to the parable of the soul, that Christians that fall by the wayside, they're not in church, are often unfruitful in their life as well. So that's the first scenario, by the wayside. The second scenario is the stony ground. Mark 4, 16, And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. So we saw from Luke 8, that you know, these people, they believed, and they, you know, they get saved because the people that didn't believe, that fell by the way, so they didn't get saved. So they receive this. They receive it with glass, have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So the sun represents the trials and tribulations that come 
to the way of the Christian and how they respond to it. And it's saying that when the Christian gets saved and they don't have deepness of understanding, have no root in themselves, they're not stable as a Christian, then the trials and tribulations can sometimes get them out of the Christian life and they're not fruitful. It doesn't allow them to bring forth fruit because they are offended. Right? Persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. So the primary application of the stony ground is that you lack a deeper understanding. You have no root in yourselves. Right? So how do you fix this problem? Right? Well, let's have a look at a few other verses. 2 Timothy 2. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? So we need to understand the word of God. And the, and the only way you're going to understand it is if you study it. It's not enough just to hear the word of God week in and week out. You know, sometimes I think about it at jiu-jitsu as well. I was talking about this with my wife, because my wife started jiu-jitsu recently, which is pretty cool. So we talk about it a bit. And, um, and I'm saying that, like, you know, sometimes I see at jiu-jitsu, like, if, if somebody just comes along once a week, and all they get is the instruction of that class, but throughout the week they don't think about it at all, they tend not to improve. Right? Because by the time you come back to your next class, you're like, you've forgotten what you've done in the last class. Right? And then you, you can't build on that understanding. And I feel like church is the same. Like church is the same. Like if you just come every Sunday, you hear the sermon, and it's like, oh, that was nice. You know, I like that one from Victor this week. Oh, this one I didn't like so much. I've heard that one before. Yeah, I'm sure people have thoughts like that in church. You know, and then you don't think about it during the week. And then the next week comes around, you've forgotten, and you haven't really applied it. You know, you don't really grow. And I think it's the same, like, uh, it's the same in jiu-jitsu, right? Like, people that don't, like, they don't really think about what they've learned in the class, try to make sure they apply it. You just forget, and, and people can be going to jiu-jitsu for week after week, month after what, month after month, and they don't really improve that much. But the people that actually apply themselves, you know, they think about what's being taught, they, they, and then they think about it through the week, they think about, oh, yeah, next time I'm in that scenario, I'm going to use that move. I mean... Christianity is like exactly the same. You need to learn something and you're going to think like, oh, that was interesting. You know, it applies to this conversation and maybe next time I have the conversation I can use that. But you know what? If you never get in that conversation, then you never get to use it. This is why you have to, you know, get into spiritual conversations because then you start using the knowledge that you learn and then it starts actually, you know, retaining with you as opposed to you learn something, it's interesting, and then you just forget it, right? Because you didn't use it. So this is why study is about, you know, really meditating and thinking of these truths and thinking how they apply and thinking how they, you know, can convince other people. And this is when you actually start to grow as a Christian. First Peter 3, verse 13, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh your reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So this is why learning the Bible is good, studying the Bible is good. It's about, hey, well, next time I'm asked a question, I want to be ready. You know, sometimes I, you know, people ask me questions about the Bible and I feel like I've, I've taught it a lot. But then, you know, you just maybe forgotten that I've taught it because you haven't used it. And the more you use the things that I teach, uh, the more it will help you to answer questions. Uh, with people when you talk with them about spiritual things. So that's the primary application of the stony ground. You know, you want, you want to lack a deeper understanding so that when trials and tribulations come your way, you're not rooted and grounded in God's Word. You don't understand what you believe, why you believe it. But like I said, the secondary application when we think also about the seed in the ground, I think about the Christian being in church but not deeply rooted in church. And what do I mean by that? I'm talking about the, the relationships that you build in church, where you know, your, the relationships you build in church can actually help your spiritual life. They keep you accountable. You know, they, they help you, encourage you. You know, you're, you're surrounding yourself with other believers. Matthew 13, 15. It says here, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? 
Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then had this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honour, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. See, the reason why I'm going to this passage here is because, you know, sometimes the more you grow your relationship to the church and the more you serve God, sometimes, you know, the less um, you'll be bothered by persecution outside of church. Right? Because, you know, you're not, you're gonna get, you know, you're not always going to have great relationships with people outside of church. The more you try and serve God, you're hoping to try and keep these relationships strong, but they don't always. But, see, when persecution comes, right, and you have somewhere to call home, then you're, some, you're less bothered by the persecution outside of the world. That's, that's what, that's what um, I'm hoping you'll reflect on today. Because when you are not so grounded in church, and you don't really see church as like, you know, your family, you know, somewhere where you call home, right? You, you sometimes worry more about relationships outside of church. Like if relationships go sour or, you know, you're trying to be spiritual and then they're making fun of you and things like that, you know, and you, you will tend to compromise more because you, you, you're worried that if you lose this friendship that you may not have other friendships in your life. But what I found in, in my life is that when I built strong relationships with people in church and that started becoming my immediate circle of friends, and my more influential circle of friends, I wasn't so bothered if my, my, my worldly friends you know, made fun of the things that I did because I felt like I had somewhere else to call home, if that makes sense. That's like, like sometimes when people get into like gangs and things like that, they're just trying to find somewhere to belong. You know? and, and what I'm saying is, is if church becomes that place where you belong, then you'll be less influenced by worldly influences, you know, bad relationships and things like that. Uh, and you'll be less bothered if those relationships go sour. I'm not saying that we, we, we you know, this, this is one thing in Christianity is people, you know, they get this, this mentality like, oh, you know, I just believe and preach the truth and they just lose all their friends. And that's not always a good thing. You know, that's not necessarily a good thing. Now, if you try and live for God, will you, will you lose some friends? Perhaps. But that should never be the, like the intention, right? You're not just out there to just try and burn all your bridges, right? So you want to try and keep these friends and you also, at the same time, don't want to be influenced too much by those outside influences. And what I'm saying is if you're planted well in a church, that those influences will be less on your life, right? Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more you see the day approaching. <clears throat> So stronger relationships means more provocation unto love and good works. Okay? Now the third uh, scenario, the thorny ground. Mark 4, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh un. Fruitful. See, I feel like this one really, you know, I, I, I tend to reflect on this one the most, even in my personal life, because I feel like this one is the one that affects people that live in our sort of society the most. You know, we don't really get much persecution from being a Christian. You know, like, what's the worst that's going to happen to you? Like, people might ridicule you. People might say, oh, what you believe is silly. But a lot of people that say that what we believe is silly, they what they believe anyway, you know, and you know, and then the, the, what they believe is even sillier, you know, if they actually had to defend what they believe. So I feel like the, the, the ridicule we get is, is just usually like ignorant, in, in my opinion, you know, it's often, more often than not. I'm not saying that they're, they're, it's all ignorant. So if we're unfruitful in our life, this tends to be more the reason why we're unfruitful. This, this, this scenario in the parable of the sower tends to apply to the people in this room more so than the sun coming up and not having deep deepness of earth, right? Because even if you don't have deepness of earth and a really good understanding, you're probably not going through that much persecution in your life. 
You know, like we're not striving unto blood, like the Bible says. Uh, so what does it say here? Matthew, uh, Luke 8. That which fell among thorns, are they, when they've heard, go forth and are choked. So what do these thorns represent? Cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. See, so our life is too much filled with cares, riches, the lusts of other things, the pleasures of this life, right? We, we live in a very prosperous country, we have a very prosperous life, uh, even though we may complain about how hard we have life, we don't have it hard, you know, we've got nice clothes, we've all got a warm bed, everyone in here you know, slept in a warm bed, slept dry, you know, you have, you have things that, you know, most of the people in the world do not have, right? And we fill our life with other things, like even more so, because we have productive lives, we're able to do these other things, and these are the things that take us away and, and make us forget about what we really should be doing in our life, which is being fruitful for God, right? So these thorns make us unfruitful. And the thing with thorns... You know, if you've ever tried to, you know, all of us, you know, at home, try and tend to your garden and the weeds come up and then, gosh, they just multiply so quickly. You know, it just, it just requires just a, a little bit of, you know, slackness on the, on the behalf of the person tending the garden and it just, it's overrun with weeds, overrun with thorns. They just, they just multiply in your life. So what's the application, the spiritual application with this scenario with the thorns is that if we're not careful, we don't take heed the thorns in our life, the weeds in our life, which are the cares, the riches, the lusts of other things, they quickly multiply, don't they? And this is why if you don't schedule in doing things for God, I mean, everyone can fill their life with things that they like to do. I mean, think about it. Like, when you've got spare time, there's always things to do. There's always movies to watch. There's always places to see. There's always places to go. There's always things that you can get, enjoy. Just fill your life with stuff. And if we're not careful, we just fill our life with these things, and what's the end result? We become unfruitful. We bring no fruit to perfection. Right? And that's the challenge. So we want to lay up treasures in heaven. Like Jesus says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. <coughs> so the heart that is amongst <coughs> brings up the thorns. There's a lot of thorns on that ground. Because remember, the ground in the parable itself represents the heart. What sort of heart do we have? So the heart that has a lot of pleasures of this life. It's choking the word that it becomes unfruitful. And you can imagine this in your mind. I don't know if you guys are getting this same picture as I preach the parable of the sower. You, you, you think of your heart, you think of this ground, and then all these thorns are coming up, and these are all the things that, like, you know, that we think about in our lives and that we, we take up all the time in our lives. When do you have time to think about the Word of God? It's like I talked about at the beginning of this sermon. When was the last time you thought about the Bible? Did you read your Bible this week? Did you speak about the Bible this week? When's the last time you talked about the Bible with somebody else? And you're thinking like far back, that that's, this is why, like, you know, when you think about this parable, that's how the stuff in your life is choking out the word because you're just so preoccupied with everything else that you don't even think about God's word. So this is why it's such a, it's such a fitting picture that these thorns come up and they hurt you. Right? You don't even realize they hurt you. Think about that parable we talked about with the, the fool eating on the thing and, and he's hurting himself. So we don't even realize that these things are hurting us. We're letting them grow in our lives, choking out the Word of God in our mind and in our heart, and we don't bring forth fruit. So, again, just like bringing in all the things in our life, the secondary application is just, you know, excessive commitments and obligations in our life that just make us too busy, too busy to come to church, too busy to serve God. Right? It's the same thing spiritually with the thorns where you're so preoccupied with the cares of this life that you don't think about the Word of God. But again, the secondary application is that people get so busy in their lives that they don't dedicate any time to serving God. 
right, and serving and, and helping to teach the Word of God, getting people saved, growing people in the church, and getting involved. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 15, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. What is he saying here? There's two things. For a wicked man, you know, just lives long, even though he lives a wicked life. But what I think he's saying here in the beginning part of verse 15 is that there's a just man, perisheth in his righteousness. What? It's because he's doing things that are not necessarily bad, but he's just filling his life with too many things. Verse 16, be not righteous over much, neither make thyself overwise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? That's what I, I think about. That's, sometimes like, that's why my health suffers sometimes. I'm just like, I think I'm doing too many things in my life. Right? Doing too many things. But it's the same in your life. You may be doing too many things. And then therefore, the, you know, your effectiveness, your growth as a Christian suffers. Right? Because you can't do everything. There's, there's more to do in this world that you have time for. And you can fill your life with too much. Right? Where you choke out the time to be fruitful for the Lord. So we have to prioritize. And Gershon touched on this passage as well last uh, fortnight ago. As the Lord commanded Moses... Uh, his servants. So did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So it's a great passage because it reminds us that the things that God had commanded Moses and Moses commanded Joshua, Joshua made sure he got those things done. And I'm sure there were a lot of things that Joshua wanted to do, but he didn't get under, that he didn't do, but all the things that God wanted him to do, he made sure that those were in his schedule. Right? We want to apply that to our lives. Right? So we need to prioritize. We need to know when to say no to things. This life is not the time for just filling it with selfishness and pleasure. Right? It's a war that we're in. We have eternity to rest and enjoy life. So don't fill up your life now with too many things and become unfruitful for God. And the last one we won't spend too much time on because the last one is the good ground. Right? So it's obvious that this one is the one that's the opposite of the, the first three. Mark 4, these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. Right, so the good ground is, is the opposite of the first. So if you think about the first one, first one is somebody's not saved, secondary application I like to think of, they're not in church. So if you're on the good ground, it's somebody that's saved, and somebody that's in church. Right? Number two, on the stony ground. Stony ground is they didn't have deepness of earth. Relationships in church were not very strong. Well, on the good ground... You're going to have understand. You're going to understand the Word of God. You know what, know what you believe. Know why you believe it. You know, be planted in church. Strong relationships. How do you build strong relationships in church? Well, you serve together. You know, like, you know, you, you, do, you do work together and you get to know people. The more time you spend with each other, you do things together. You know, that's why the people that go soul winning together or they serve in a ministry together, they always become better friends, right? Because they're doing work together. That's how you build strong relationships. Right? And then the last one was the thorny ground. The thorny ground was when you have too much thought of the cares of this life, deceitfulness, just riches, pleasures of things in the world. So what's the opposite? If you set your affections on things above, you're thinking about the things of God, you're meditating on God's Word, you're using God's Word, right? So that God's Word stays at the front of your mind, and the more it stays at the front of your mind, the more likely you're going to talk about these things, the more likely you're going to take opportunities to preach the gospel to somebody else because you're thinking about it. Right? You're ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you. Right? Now, the other thing here in Mark 4.20 is we see here that people bring forth different amounts. So a couple of things here is obviously it's good to be more productive <coughs> Bringing forth a hundredfold is, is in one way better than bringing forth 30-fold and 60-fold. But another thing you've got to remember is people are going to bring forth differing amounts. So it's not always wise to directly compare yourself to others because other people are in different situations. They know different things. They're a different stage of growth. Right? So on the one hand, this is like a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand... You don't want to be discouraged because you look at what somebody else may be doing for the Lord and be discouraged from even doing anything for the Lord. 
But at the same time, you don't want to use it as an excuse. Some people use it as an excuse to say, oh, you know, well, I don't have, like, you know, I'm not, I don't have, I'm not in the same situation as this person. That's why this person can do all this, but I can't. Well, you just do as much as you can with what you have. And be encouraged that, you know, that it's okay that there's going to be different amounts of productivity. But be encouraged that we know because of the parable of the pounds and the talents, God's going to reward us according to what he's given us. So, you know, you just do what you can with what you have and God will reward us accordingly, right? Luke 8 verse 15. <coughs> but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Right? So it's not just enough to hear the word. Right? Having heard the word, they keep it. So it's like, I'm not going to go to James. But you know, we know in James, it says you don't want to just be a hearer of the word. You want to be a doer. Otherwise, you're going to forget. So the ones on the good ground, they don't just hear. They hear and they do. And look, they bring forth fruit with patience. Now, patience in the Bible, remember, in the King James Bible, patience is not just being willing to wait for something, like when you're patiently waiting. Patience in the King James Bible is that when you are you know, consistently doing something and going through the trials and tribulations of life, but continuing to be patient in the sense that you keep consistent, you're consistent and you keep doing it, right? So what I'm trying to point out here is, you know, bringing forth fruit is not easy. You know, bringing forth fruit takes work. Bringing forth fruit requires diligence. You know, bringing forth fruit requires consistency. Right? So it's going to require consistency. And this is why, you know, the, the Christian life sometimes will feel like a grind because that's what work is. You know, work sometimes just requires the grind of being consistent and keeping on doing it because you've got to bring forth fruit with patience. And this is why people that, you know, they go soul winning or they just go for a bit and they go, oh, it didn't work. You know, you've got to bring forth fruit with patience. Right? What does that mean? You've got to go week after week after week after week. You keep going and you're going to bring forth fruit. But if you go like one week here and then you never go again and you do it in one week here, well, of course you're not going to bring forth fruit because you're going to bring forth fruit with patience. You're going to be consistent and keep going. And you'll see that fruit. You'll see the growth, right? And as you bring forth fruit, like Jesus says, he'll purge it, bring forth more fruit. You know, I reflect on my own life. And, you know, the, 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 periods, the periods of growth for me were you know, what I feel like I grew the most is when I was preaching the gospel the most. You know, and like, especially as a new believer, you, you start talking about the word of God, you're thinking about it, you're trying to explain it, people, people ask you questions and you'll go look it up more and it's like, you, you, that's when you start growing, right? Because you're actually trying to persuade people of the gospel. And, you know, and, and then, you know, you're a young Christian and, you know, your life is not, you know, how it should be. You know, maybe a bit hypocritical in some things or, you know, you've still got some sin in your life. But, you know, but as you go out, you, you, you're thinking, I, I want to be effective, you know, when I, when I preach the gospel to my friends, when I talk about it. So you start thinking, you know, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a hypocrite, right? So then you start, like, you know, trying to clean up your life because you're trying to tell them, like, you know, Christianity is important and... This is when your life starts cleaning up. It starts to make changes in your life. That's, this is why when I think of John 15 and I think of bringing forth fruit and God purging your life and, and that it may bring forth more fruit, I can't help but think about my own life and think about you know, when I started out as a Christian trying to preach the gospel and as a young man and then you know, trying to clean up my life, you know, trying to get the swearing out of my language and you know, changing the way I... I, I, I present myself and talk to people, things like that, and try to get, get the bad habits out of my life. You know, like get, get the bad habits of like, uh, you know, I was drinking too much a lot when I was younger. You know, trying to get that out of my life. Because I felt that, not that people need to give up drinking to get saved, but then obviously if you're trying to preach the gospel to your friends and you're getting drunk, 
I mean, your witness is not going to be as powerful as somebody who's living godly life. They're going to take you more seriously, right? So this is why when you live a serious Christian life, it's not that you're any more saved than you were before, but people are going to take what you say more seriously, right? And this is how, as you grow and you get these sins out of your life, you know, you try and be fruitful, you'll, you'll grow even more, okay? So some self-reflection. Now, how is your heart? You know, what sort of ground is your heart? Is your heart, I hope it's not the first one, I hope you guys are all saved, but you know, is your heart stony ground? Do like, you not understand what you believe very well? Is your heart one that is too taken away with the cares of this life, with the deceitfulness of riches? You know, are you growing in your knowledge of God's word? You know, do you know how to defend your faith, give answers to objections? Now, how is your church attendance? Is your church attendance consistent? You know, how are your relationships with the people of God, this church? Are you growing in your relationships with people of God? What are the priorities in your life? Do you love pleasure more than God? Are the pleasures of this life choking out the word of God in your heart? You know, could you be doing more for God and less for yourself? You know, so you don't become unfruitful. You know, are you growing in your service to God? You know, are you doing more things for God as you grow? You know, are you being fruitful or are you becoming unfruitful? So God wants us to be fruitful Christians. I hope today's sermon encourages you in that. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the, your word. Thank you for the reminder to be fruitful. Lord, and I pray that, uh, you know, all of us will try and bring forth fruit in our life. And I pray that through that desire to want to preach the gospel, get other people saved and teach others to, to, to live according to your ways, Lord, so that they can preach the gospel to others and get people saved. I pray that that will help us to grow, Lord. So help us not to have the cart before the horse, Lord, to just help us to, to do what we can with what we've got, to grow, to be fruitful. And Lord, may you purge us that we bring forth more fruit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.